truth about themselves to understand what went wrong. I know we can find a way. I know we can find a way. I know we can find. Welcome to the program. We're doing a part three series and hopefully a four on uh, affirmative action. Uh, we're trying to get rid of it, and uh, the NAACP want us to keep it. And, no. <laughs> so we're talking about affirmative action here today. If you missed the last two weeks, call the TV station and they will replay it for you. My guest today is Molly Murner. Munger. Munger. <laughs> and she's the uh, Legal Defense and Education Fund of the NAACP. Delores, you're looking at this lady like you're thinking, Lord, I hope she can get out of here all right. No, I wasn't thinking about that at all. I, I actually wanted to. Um, oh, okay. Well, hold that thought. We'll get right to you. But uh, what I want to, let's talk for a minute about the uh, illegitimacy rate of black people and compare it to white people. Can you do that? You have a yes, I can. Mm -hmm. we, we talked about that in our first uh, meeting, and at that time I, I didn't have the numbers, but I, I, I have found them since. And my point at the time had been that someone in the audience, or, or perhaps you had said, well, you know, we have this terrible crisis in the black family, and it's the demise, I think was the term, of the black family. And um, I said the numbers really didn't tend to show that. What the numbers tend to show is that although there are historically very high rates of unmarried parenthood among African-American women, and this is a, a, a phenomenon that goes back uh, till bef before emancipation, mm -hmm. that what has really happened is that black uh, illegitimacy rates and white have come, as the years have gone by, closer and closer together. For example, in 1940, which was at the, at the edge of the Great Migration North, um, whites uh, had 2% of white births were to unmarried mothers, and 17% of African American births were to unmarried mothers. That's a multiple of eight and a half times as many uh, black unmarried mothers mm -hmm. as white. Today, um, in 1991, rather, 68% of births are to, of black births are to unmarried mothers, and 22% of white births. So white illegitimate births have gone from 2% in 1940 to 22% or nearly one in four today. We don't have a crisis in the black family. The black family is actually uh, has, has de in terms of its illegitimacy, has declined as a percentage of white. We have a rising amount of white illegitimacy compared to black illegitimacy. And why is that? I don't know exactly why. Um, I, my own biases tend to be that this is a, a matter of very, very intense personal choice, and how people structure their families is something that is very a very personal choice to them. Do you think it has anything at all to do with the the decline of morality in this country. <laughs> it's like, what, do you know what morality? Well, <laughs> one of the problems I have with the, with the question is that it's just that. The, the term morality is an extremely broad term. And so I'm not really sure in what sense you're asking. Uh, you don't have to. Um, you don't have to be married anymore. It's, it's, it's okay to live with a woman before uh, uh, marriage. It's okay for kids to have babies because they're making love. Uh, homosexuality is being accepted. Uh, prostitution is being accepted. Everything that is wrong uh, in this country is now being accepted as being right, whereas before it used to be wrong and we knew it was wrong. And so, uh, women are going out having babies. I mean, they're saying that I have a career now, I want a child, but I don't want the man. So they have babies without the man being there, you know, the husband. And all that has a lot to do with the, this report. 
Uh, uh, do you think, do you understand that? I, mean, I, under, that? I understand what you're saying. I think this whole topic is so incredibly complicated. It has to do with factors that are way beyond what we could do justice to here today. Mm. It, I think it has but to be really complicated. But not to me. I, I see that black men have been lazy, perverted, uh, not living right, not setting a standard. That's why we have 68% of our women having babies today. To me, that is frightening. That's scary. You said it's not that important, but it's scary. <laughs> To know that 68% of women are having babies without husbands? Well, let's let me look at let, let's look at some other phenomena that are going on about about black mothers and black families. Um, if you look at the illegitimacy rate alone, and you have the idea that the only way to have a stable, um, create a stable environment for a child is with two parents who are married to each other, if that's if that's your your bias, and I do think it is a bias, then uh, this illegitimacy rate is going to, you're going to predict all kinds of chaos. And what has actually happened, remember the achievement scores? Mm -hmm. Remember this just gigantic increase in black achievement test scores? The RAND Corporation, when it's, it, it, the title of its study is called Student Achievement and the Changing American Family. And the guys who did it, it uh, Rand does a lot of work for the Defense Department, and I think they were kind of conservative. And they, and they took on this. Obviously, what they were gunning for was they, they wanted to show, I suspect, that the, that the decline in marriage rates and the increase in single parent families was causing a horrible impact on educational attainment. And they expected that they'd find that, especially among African Americans. And so they did this study. And they found that even though black and white illegitimacy rates are still increasing, and even though black illegitimacy in single parent households are, are very high in the African American community, black achievement test scores are way, way up. And what they, what they figured out was black women are, it turns out that the thing that really helps a child achieve is the mother's educational attainment, her care for the child, how old she is when she has him or her, and how many other children she has. And what's happened is that black women are getting better educations, they're taking good care of their children, they're having fewer children, and they're putting off the, the, the date of the first child. White teenage pregnancy is actually a higher multiple in terms of the poverty rate. More, there's more problem among white poor people with early teenage pregnancy than there is among black people. That's, so we have a problem with the family, but black women do not deserve to be you know, completely bashed and trashed on this. They're, they're... <laughs> Let me tell you this about black women. And they're, can you stand up for me? Black women, not all. Black women are mean, and they're becoming men. They are, they are more man than a black man is now. Uh, they're very angry and disappointed in men. And that's why you see it look like they're becoming tough. And, and I mean, they have no other choice, really, because we're so weak now that we can't even deal with them. That's why you see a, a high percentage of black men marrying non-black women. They'll marry white women because white women tend to, to cater to him a little more than the black woman would. You know, like, it's, it's OK. It's not your fault. It's due to slavery. Just stay here, and I'll take care of you. But we have failed them, and that's why you see uh, the situation that you see. It has nothing. Those people need to go back and do that study again. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's because of uh, the lack of father in the home that we see that destruction. Yes, ma'am. Yes, I'd like to get back to the affirmative action issue for right. a moment. Thank you. Um, what I was saying before was that um, Certain black children come from families where education is not important, studying is not encouraged, therefore the children may not have good grades to get into college. Also, students are going to, many black students go to inferior high schools. And I'm concerned that if um, students were not allowed into colleges, um, that that would cut off a lot of black kids who really come from disadvantaged backgrounds. And the reason I say this, as I was saying to you earlier, was that I come from that kind of a situation where education wasn't important, um, nobody w in my family had ever gone to college before. It was not expected of me to do anything. Um, as a result of affirmative action programs, I was able to get into college. When I got into college, I took it very seriously. 
and I consequently studied very hard, and I graduated from college. The first person in my family ever to do so, and the last person in my family ever to do so. And there are a lot of kids that come from that kind of situation, where they come from these inferior schools, the education that they're getting is not up to par, they're not taking the same level chemistry classes, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that if you allow, I look back on my situation and I look at kids now in similar situations and I say, what if, what if nobody had allowed me that opportunity? What if nobody had, and as a result, and during my generation, when I was going through college under an affirmative action program, there were students from my neighborhood who were in similar situations, single parent families, no father around, who got into college, became judges, doctors, nurses, um, various kinds of occupations. So I think that just across the board to say that we're not going to let any of these kids in school, I think it's wrong. Now the other thing I want to say... Let me it, respond to that first. And don't, ho don't forget what you want to say. How did affirmative action allow you to enter into this university? It allowed me to enter into school because my GPA for high school was not up to par because I was not studious in high school. My grades were not up to par. My SAT scores were not up to the level that they should have been. Un under standard admission, my SAT scores were not what they should have been for a standard admission. My grades were not what they should have been for standard admission. When I got into college, I was at a disadvantage because the, the first of all, I, wasn't, I hadn't been a studious person in high school. Second of all, the inferior quality of the education as opposed to people coming from suburbia. When I got in, into college, I had to overcompensate. I had to study all night. I mean, I had to study a lot to get through college. And well, I was good. able to do White well in college. Do but what I'm, saying, what I'm saying is there are a lot of students like me who wouldn't have gotten in. Now, the other <clears> point I wanted to okay, make. Okay, let me, I, I know. I'm sorry. Um, why didn't you go, do you have to have the, uh, do you have to take the same SAT test to, do, to go to a junior college as you do a, a, a four-year university? No, uh, not test? for a junior college. So why did you just say, well, if I'm not up to par, let me go to a junior college see, okay, and get my okay. high school education there. I and can explain that. First of all, I didn't expect to go to college. I got into college on a fluke, basically. Affirmative well, action. A fluke. <laughs> 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 well, yes, that's true, but let me explain. Let me explain I, further. Okay. Uh, the year, uh, when I went to college, Martin Luther King had been assassinated. After the assassination of Martin Luther King, schools were starting to take black students. They said, we've got to get black students in here, okay? So they, the money was flowing. The money was flowing. They started letting a lot of black students in. I, my friend in high school had said to me, hey, you know, I'm applying to Northeastern University. Um, I'm going to apply to the nursing program. Why don't you apply to? I'm like, are you kidding me? Go to college? It was like a joke. Um, and so we all started applying to this university. We, several of us got in, okay? Now... Are you proud of that? I'm proud that I was able to go to college and finish, yes, because I, let me finish. When I got my degree, I got my degree because I worked for my degree. Nobody gave me a degree because well, they let you a lot in. of people, you didn't earn it. a lot of people... But look, they, you didn't lot, earn it. Can I finish, please? Yes, ma'am. A lot of people of all of the students that were accepted from my high school and from other high schools that were accepted, most of the kids flunked out. Not because they were stupid, not because they couldn't do the work, but because they partied all the time. They were lazy. I, exactly. I did the work. I got my degree just like everybody else with a college degree. No, I don't feel bad because I got in that way. Because of my family background, I wouldn't have gone to college. I might have been a statistic in the street. I might have been on drugs. I might, because I was very bitter and very angry. Because I knew I was intelligent. I used to read all the time, but I just could not deal with the school system. I felt that the school system was racist. I was very angry and hostile like a lot of kids are today. Fortunately, I think college might have saved my life in that sense. But the point is, no, I don't feel bad that I got in that way because I didn't earn anything because I earned my college degree and I think I'm a very intelligent person. I don't have any, but because of my family background, that's what I'm trying to explain to you. Because your kids coming Honestly. from certain family backgrounds where they don't have families that are encouraging them to study, they may have, have nobody in their family may have ever been to college before. But still, that is no reason to create affirmative action. You don't want to uh, 
uh, discriminate against someone else because you come from no, a screwed up family. No, I don't think you family. should discriminate against anybody else. <laughs> but that's I don't what you're think doing. You, no, that's I don't what affirmative think so. action does. I don't think so, but I do think to some degree transgressions of the past have to be made up. And in my case... What do you mean by that? What I mean by that <laughs> is the fact that because of the history of this country of black people and because schools are below par, because schools are below standard, the funding for inner city schools is not the same. We all know that they don't have computer labs and all those kinds of things like they have in other schools. Let me tell because you Because of that, you have to make, make up <clears throat> some compensation for that. But you know why we have screwed up school? Because we are so messed up. The fathers don't go and check out the schools to make sure they function in the right way. We don't take care of our children. Everything is on the woman, and she can't do everything, and that's why our schools are screwed up. I, ha I want to. You're not absolutely correct. Wait a minute. I want. Let's take a break, and then we'll come back, and I will let you respond. We do have a guest here tonight. Back in a moment. Okay. <laughs> it's electric. Bond, the Brotherhood organization of a new destiny. Rebuilding the family by rebuilding the man. Call us toll-free, 1-800-411-BOND. That's 1-800-411-BOND. <laughs> okay, we are back and moving fast. All right, cut it out. Okay, respond to her. <laughs> well, first of all, I completely agree with Diane, and I think it... it it should be said so that the television audience knows that what Diane does now, she's a teacher. And she's helping other kids get ahead. And I just can't think that that's a wrong thing. I just, there's just nothing in me that thinks that's a thing. I think that's wrong. nice, but the way she got it is wrong. Well, the second thing I wanted <laughs> Diane, to say, no, excuse me. Okay, yeah, the yeah. second thing I wanted to say was what came up was um, about black fathers and how black fathers are failing. And I, I was reminded of something that, that should be said about black fathers. Again, these broad stereotypes are really very unfair. And um, one of the things that they did, Diane was reminding us about the period in the late 60s where they opened up previously all white or hugely white institutions for the first time and they made money available so that uh, African American kids could go to college. and. The, the kids came through and they, a lot of them did well and it was a very important moment in the sort of development of, of, of a step of progress that's been made here. And Diane is part of that and that went on at universities all over the country after Martin Luther King was shot. Studies were done of those kids and studies have done, been done of college kids you know, ever since. And one of the things that they have found when they compare high achieving college black kids with the white counterparts is that compared to their white counterparts they cite encouragement of their fathers with much more frequency than white kids do. Black kids who achieve are indeed very well cared for by their fathers and what has happened is sometimes there wasn't a father and so it was an uncle, it was a grandfather, it was an older brother, there was, they, they very often at a higher rate than white cited the positive influence of a black father or father surrogate. Black men are nurturing and caring for black right. men. So if that, is, if that is true, that is why we need to put black fathers back in the home with the 68% of women who are having babies without fathers. Well, right? Hold on one minute, sir. Just hold on. Is that right or not? Well, the, as I say, I think the, the, the whole dilemma of the black family is really beyond, it. first of all, we're here to talk about affirmative action, it's a very complicated topic, but I will say that one thing that happens, and I, I know this just from studying anthropology and sociology when I was younger, is that the way people are socialized, women are socialized to try to find a man who can take care of them, white women, black women, all women that I know in America, we imbibe a certain attitude, it gets into us very early, that we should find a man who, who, who's up, who who sort of lift us up. Who can take care of you. That's something that... What's that, wrong with that? Well, I'm just saying that's what women are trained to look for. Now, if you have a society that is treating black men in a very unfair way, over a long period of time and is treating black women who are less threatening 
in a less bad way, although mm -hmm. terrible, but less bad. What happens is your two, your two piles get into slightly different shape. The, the women rise more easily and higher. The black men have a weight upon them that keeps them down. And a lot of black women have a hard time finding a man that's higher than they are because their counterparts have been squashed. Now that's not the fault. To blame that on the, on the black man is really unfair. And to blame it on the black woman who's just, you know, who she's we, not unfair, right, that's we, unfair too. Who should we blame the, it on? You should blame it on the history that has occurred. Right. And you should work to change things so that that history doesn't, it is, is overcome. That. We should I, overcome that this. history. I have to tell you, it is my fault that if I allow the government to come in and take care of my woman, I, I step back and let the government take care of my woman, the white man or whomever, they can't do it if I don't allow it. So if the black man didn't allow it to happen, it wouldn't happen. It's his fault that it's happening. I don't agree with you. Uh, make your, you know what, we got, I'm sorry, we, so many other people want to say something. The Lois is burning. Go ahead, Martin, real quick. Did you have your hand up? No, you go on now. Okay. Yeah, real quick. Uh, in World War II, there were um, a group of uh, black men who wanted to fly real bad, and they were kept down because white men at the time didn't believe that black men could fly. They didn't think they could do the job. Uh, so they gave them inferior planes. These were P-41s. They were the, the, the fighter plane. They gave them inferior planes, inferior equipment. These guys had to learn how to build the planes, how to repair the planes. They had to steal parts from each other. And they flew, and not only did they have to repair their own planes, because you know, they weren't given a lot of equipment, money, or anything, but after they did all this, repaired the planes, got them up flying and stuff, they were sent on missions to protect the, um, the bombers. And they were the only group who had a flawless record throughout the war. They did not have one bomber shot down with these black pilots um, um, protecting them. Escort. Yeah, escort, right. And so that just speaks for, even though they were kept down, they were given a little crack of an opening, and they made a huge amount out of it. And I mean, it, even in a society where it was, you know, thought that they could not do it, but they were just given, and they were given, you know, t in order to fail, they still succeeded because they did believe in themselves. Yeah. And that's what's missing. No, Thank no, I, 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 I love your story. I love your story, and, and one of the things that, that is, we, we say a lot is that black people in America were given a crumb, and they made a feast out of it. That's exactly what has happened in story after story after story. People were not given anything. Everything was secondhand. Everything was worse, and they've done a wonderful job. And, but that is not an excuse that the white community can, can use to continue hogging all the benefits and privileges, uh, a disproportionate share of the benefits and privileges to itself, not sharing, trying to keep people down, trying to end enforcement of the civil rights laws, which is what this whole affirmative action is really about, as we learned by reading the bell curve. This, this, if you just read the book, you'll see that the goal is we're going to end affirmative action, and, and, and that is just the first step. What we're really going to do is we're going to end enforcement of the civil rights laws. And I can't, I can't agree that what black people need in America today is more pain, trouble, and oppression because it makes them strong. I mean, I, I, they just need. have had enough. Thank you very much. One thing that we don't need is affirmative action. We do not need any more pro programs at all. We need to get our butt out there and earn it. Thank and that's what we want to do. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I'll start by saying I do have ambiguous feelings about affirmative action, especially yeah. in the case of someone like Diane who really made it by getting a foot in the door. I appreciate that, but I want to make a point against affirmative, affirmative action in the case of um, there was uh, slavery in America and there was slavery in, in Europe, and the black slaves in Europe weren't given housing and they weren't given clothing and uh, in the West Indies particularly, specifically. And the um, blacks that come from um, the West Indies to America, they're super, they're super achievers. They become people like Colin Powell and uh, Shirley Chisholm and uh, high achievers because they weren't given things. They yeah. had to go out, they, they were slaves. They had to earn their own housing and their own clothing. Yeah. And, and so that made them stick together and find a way to do it, not just sit back and get it done for them. Anything? Well, I think the same observation applies, which is 
these are very good stories and we should hear more of them because people, <laughs> no, white people, no, no, we're trying to do. because people are stereotyping black people so badly in this country, you making know, it seem like they're all failures and weak and in, in fact they have wonderful stories to tell about what wonderful things they've done with with very, very little to work with. It, they are a triumphant, wonderful group of people who are being maligned you know in our society that? right now. That is being done by Jesse Jackson, Maxine Waters, the NAACP, the Black uh, Congressional Caucus, uh, liberal white women, uh, homosexuals, <laughs> all the people who are crazy and hate this country, they're the one giving this false perception of what black people can and has done. Excuse me, and, Jesse, excuse me. I think I have been very courteous and worked with you throughout this whole debate, which has gone on for a long time. <clears throat> but the one thing that you will never say to me is that I hate my country. That is absolutely, I just, I can take no quarter. And I would like you to apologize right Are now. Are you a liberal white woman? I, if you will not apologize, I'm leaving the show. I, I, I am a totally devoted to this country. And one of the things that I love most about this country is that it has a really wonderful rich history with lots of wonderful people who have done marvelous things including its African American people and to sit here hour after hour and listen to you trash African American people and then cap it off with accusing me of hating the country is just a little bit more than I want to tolerate right now so if I would like you to apologize to me for suggesting that I do not love America as much as everybody does we all love America let me would ask, you this, apologize yeah, please? But let, me ask all first, right. let me ask first what, where did I accuse you? I didn't, I, I, I didn't say anything personally toward you. And where did I accuse you? Well, Jesse, I think we, no, 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 we, I, I we know, know what you. happened. Let's move on. You've well, apologized. Are we out of time again? <laughs> oh, my goodness. We'll be back and then we'll talk about that. Because I don't know where I accuse you. I just named groups of people. I didn't personally say you. But we'll come back Monday and you'll find out how did I accuse Molly. We'll be back <laughs> next week. <laughs> back in a minute. Oh, bye. Bye. No, I don't know how to do No, I don't know how to do Somewhere in the world today Men have got to stand up strong Take the truth about themselves To understand what went wrong I know we can find a way I know we can find a way Welcome to the Jesse Peterson Show. This is a four-part four part series on affirmative action. Uh, I have to tell you personally, I am not happy with it. I'm glad that we're finally going to get rid of it. Uh, and hopefully we can get rid of all the programs uh, and black men um, can begin to earn their way, um, take control of their families and their community, and hopefully affirmative action would go and we can do that. Uh, my guest today, if you haven't uh, tuned in in the past weeks, is uh, Molly Munger. Yes. All right. And she's with the Legal Defense and Education Fund 
of the uh, NAACP. Um, she's a lawyer. Yes. All right. You know, the NAACP is now ran by a woman. Is that right? Is that the right group? A woman. I think Merle Evers has just become chairman of their board, chairperson oh. of their board. So a man is still over her. Well, I'm not sure who the executive director is with oh, okay. Ben Chavis leaving. I think that ju that's where I'm, I'm missing that fact. You know, I, I do want to say that I do appreciate you uh, coming here tonight and, and talking with us. It's very hard to get uh, uh, people who disagree to come together uh, in the way that you have tonight. I do appreciate it. Well, thank you. I really I, do. It's, it, it's, it's what makes ideas develop, is to talk them out and and discuss it. Absolutely. Uh, the lady in the purple said uh, last week that uh, blacks haven't really foc or didn't focus on education in the past, and that's why she needed affirmative action. One of the reasons, besides having a messed up family. That is not quite true. Uh, I'm 45 years of age, and I can remember uh, uh, when I went to high school, most of the kids went to college except that they went to black colleges. Uh, the men, for the most part, didn't go because they had to work in the, in the cotton fields. They had to work. But the women went to school, and they, they became teachers and, and, and um, lawyers and everything during those days. So blacks have always focused on education. Uh, so it's not true that they didn't focus on education. Am I right about that or wrong? You're right. Because we have many black universities, and I know a lot of my family members went to, went to college. They went to black colleges, but they did go. Is that right? Well, Jesse, that's one of those things, you know, I was pro of some and a little, because like Diane... Can you stand up so they can see you back Oh, yeah. okay, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, please. please. You know, Jesse, I was saying maybe I was uh, really not for it, but then some. Yeah. Because uh, what did I say? There are some students that enter the universities and then they take full advantage of it. Diane did work herself, improve herself, and became a role model to the community, whereas maybe before she wouldn't have done it. And that's, that's an advantage. It's a lot of students that wouldn't have entered the universities, Jesse, and that would have been a waste, whereas this got them there. Let me finish. It got them there. Okay. It got them there, and... It brought out what they needed, you know. Maybe she didn't have the mentoring and the role model at home, but somewhere, being a bright young woman, somebody saw the potential in her and motivated her and planted that seed, and that's all you really need. That was it's, before school, though, right? She was motivated before she went to college. I don't know. I think she yeah. got in the environment, and she right. really excelled in the environment. That's my opinion, all right? But once the seed was planted, it was no stopping a woman like this or anyone else. But that got her there. Sometime, what's the saying? You have to be at the right place at the right time or whatever, and that's what got her there, whatever it takes to bring out a person that's going to grow. One quick question. Um, if they are going to lower the standard to let a person in like that, shouldn't they lower it to let everybody in who is having that kind of problem, whether they're black or white, male or female? I don't think they lowered it to let Diane in. I think anybody could go in. It's but like should the they do it for, across for it. the board? That's my only question. I think they question. should do it across the board. Oh, okay. I think it is across the board. It is. That was, it, it is across the board. It so white kids is. could get in on that same affirmative action thing? The, the, the Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Okay, thank Go you, ahead. Jesse. Uh -huh. The major affirmative action plans at most big colleges are not just race-based, race and ethnicity-based. Mm -hmm. They include consideration of the able student from any deprived socioeconomic background who has made yes. the most of what he or she has. So, okay. so really the test here in, 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 for all of this, this kind of affirmative action is what has the child made of the opportunities that he or she was given? And you talk a lot, Jesse, about lazy, and I'm, I'm here to tell you that admissions officers look for lazy, and they don't let in lazy. Hmm. What they look for is they look for the kid who has um, tried and given their best in an environment where no matter how much they did, the, the educational environment was simply not there for them to get them up to uh, the, the, the highest level. 
Okay. Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah. Excuse me. One of the comments that I wanted to make about you know studying in school is that the library is free, right? Yes. Do I understand usually. it. And I'm thinking, if you know how to read, you can pretty much teach yourself a lot of these things. And I think college is good and all that, but. If a student is so inclined to want to study and want to learn, I think um, one of the things she mentioned is that she, they kind of goofed off in, um, in high school. They didn't really study. They didn't really take that seriously. And I'm thinking, like, if anybody who doesn't take their education seriously or they don't study, they're not going to be accepted. I don't think that by having affirmative action and putting you in a class and then, you know, maybe they, it's good that they were there and they finally finished it. I don't see how that makes any difference. If you wanted to study and if you wanted to teach yourself, why do we need affirmative action to do that? I don't understand that. Because Let the libraries are there. You can read and teach yourself. There are books to teach you how to learn better. So I don't see why is it that somebody would need to have that. If are you, you were for it or against it? No, I'm not for affirmative action because, okay. once again, I'm thinking once the high school level that teaches you some basic things, right, you could actually teach yourself if you wanted to. So why couldn't you just study on your own or whatever things it takes for you to get to college? I don't understand you. why you would need somebody else to do that for you. That's a good answer. Well, the, there are kids of all colors who are very good at that. But the test of the society shouldn't be over here we run a school where the kids are handed everything on a silver platter with the best equipment and the best textbooks and all kinds of high teacher-student ratios and enriched programs. So they don't have to go to the library and figure it all out for themselves. It's just fed to them. And over here, we have kids who get nothing, and they've got to be in the library like Abraham Lincoln, teaching him himself everything out of books that he has to borrow by walking through the snow. That is not the kind, that's not fair. That is not a fair system. And for you to say, well, I think it's perfectly fair for the black kids to have to work twice or three times as hard as the privileged white kids over here just doesn't seem right to me. But wouldn't that make the black kid better, in a sense, if he had to work harder than this lazy white guy who think that he can make it through life kind of easy? And if he did get through life a little easy, wouldn't this white kid develop a stronger character than that white guy? Well, you know, there's that wonderful expression, which is, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. If you want to kill a lot of black kids, if you want to squash out their, their hope, you can make life really, really, really hard for them. And then the few that get through are going to be really great people. And you know what, Jesse? In essence, that's what we've already done in this country. And but I'm saying, I'm saying enough weights on the ankles for the black community. They have done it for us. We've given them narrow little windows of opportunity. We've oppressed them with heavy weights. And they have come up through the pavement. They've done it already. I say it's time to level the playing field and let, let the, 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 the black kid be served his education on a silver platter just like the white kid. And don't call either one of them lazy. Just say it's equal opportunity and it's a level playing field. Wow. Yes, ma'am. Well, let me tell you, Herb, because no, time. Go, go ahead, real quick. Okay, yeah. Once again, what I was saying is that even if the worst situation is that you had nothing offered to you, you could still go to the library and do that. That's yeah. all I was saying. If nothing was even offered there, you could still do it. There's stuff offered galore now, and I don't see why we would need any more. But even if, even if it wasn't offered, we could still go to the library, and it doesn't even cost anything to go to the library. And you can learn and study anything that you were interested in, we say computers are lacking, then you could go to where those things are. I think I've responded. Let's say, yes. No, go ahead, miss. No, it's okay. Yeah, no, no, no. Take your, we, we'll move to her next. Go ahead. Okay, well, I just have a question is that. Um, Let if, me direct this show, please. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, a comment then. If there are people that feel like this, why not? If no, I mean, you can ask your question, but I'm talking about the oh, okay. situation. Um, if people feel this way, why and legislation like this passes, why not let it pass? Why, if the people are speaking this way and this is what they want, why not let it be this way? Well, all of you have the right to vote. If you want to make the authors of the bell curve very happy, and if you want to return to the days of Plessy versus Fer Ferguson, in which your opportunities are severely truncated and you can't 
you don't have a fair chance and you think you want to do that to yourselves because you think it's going to be good for your character, there is nothing that I can do to stop you. I think it is a very foolish thing to do. So you think that in 1995, if we didn't have affirmative action, if we didn't have the programs that we now have, that we would go back in time? I definitely think people are trying to turn back the clock and push us back in time. That's exactly what this is all about. But uh, I think that we need to go back in time and pick up some of the uh, moral aspect of society that we used to live by. We need that. That's what's wrong now. We don't have it anymore. Well, I agree with and that. So I agree with that. Let me, let me tell you one thing we used to have that we don't have, and that is we used to have a much flatter income distribution in this country. What has happened in the country is that we now have four cities in the world that have approximately the same gap between rich and poor, and they are New York, Los Angeles, Rio de Janeiro, and Calcutta. That's what's happened to this country, and it's a, it's a terrible tragedy. And that yawning gap between rich and poor that is, we haven't had it since the days of the, of the old robber barons before the turn of the century. We haven't been running gaps. Those are third world type gaps that we're running right now. And what, when people get nostalgic for the old days and the 50s and all this, I say fine, the one thing we should bring back from the 50s is a much narrower gap between the richest and the poorest among us. You know, yeah. Please. Well, for one thing I'd like to say is that um, I'm not that old, so I'm not getting nostalgic, but I mean, what you're saying is that if I want to vote against that way, that I subscribe to the views of the authors of that book, and I'm not saying that I feel that black pe people are inferior, but what I'm saying is that maybe that we all just need to work a little bit harder. It doesn't necessarily mean by me voting that way that I'm subscribing to their views. And then you also say, said that if... I um, want to vote that way. That's my choice, and I can go back and, um, you know, go back to the state which you feel is a lot worse. But I mean, so then if I don't feel the way you feel, um, then I'm automatically um, subscribing to that view that that your view that we will be returning to a state that is um, worse off than we are right now. Well, I, I have to say that I would not feel that I wasn't. I would not feel that I was doing what I should be doing if I didn't point out, as I have in these four sessions, what is what what at least a lot of us believe is really going on with this effort. We think it we, we think it's an assault on the Civil Rights Act. We think it's racially driven, at least in some measure. We think it's uh, driven by people who already control disproportionate benefits in the economy and are trying to stamp on the fingers of African Americans who are climbing up the ladder. We don't think it's a, it's a pretty picture. Oh. And, and, and when you say to me, you know, don't do, are you trying to make me wrong for voting for this initiative? I can't make you wrong. You have to make up your mind. But I wouldn't be participating in a dialogue between us if I didn't tell you that, yes, I think it's wrong. I think to cooperate with this initiative is a very, a very bad and foolish thing for anybody of any color in this country to do. It's a divisive, bad measure that's going to put us on a backward trend, and it's going to be a very, very dangerous development. There are many blacks, rich and poor, or middle class, or whatever, who is against affirmative action. <laughs> What do you think about them? Pardon me? There are many blacks who are against affirmative action. White, I mean, uh, poor and rich and middle class. Uh, they are against affirmative action. They will vote against it. What do you think about their mindset? Well, I would hope... Are we taking a break? Okay, hold that thought. We'll take a break, and when we come back, you can yeah. deal with it. All right, we'll be back in a moment. It's electric! Bond, the Brotherhood Organization of a New Destiny. Rebuilding the family by rebuilding the man. Call us toll free, 1-800-411-BOND. That's 1-800-411-BOND. Okay, we are, we are back and we're gonna uh, talk about what's gonna happen with this whole affirmative act affirmative action issue. I asked Molly during the break, would she come over to our side now that she knows that there are blacks who are against it? But she said no? No, you won't come I over? won't do that. Okay. Um, 
Oh, what do you think about those blacks who are against affirmative action? They don't want it. Well, I, I would hope that we're pretty early in the process of talking about affirmative action. And I would hope that as we discussed what it really is and what it really does, a lot of African Americans who might have started out thinking that, yeah, I'm against that, would actually, upon reflection, see that it is a very important thing, that it isn't something that is destroying their character or, or, or disgracing them or anything. It is, it is something w that, that basically gives African Americans some credit for what they've been up against for a long time and what they've been really heroic fighting all this time, and that is an only incomplete, only minuscule and tiny corrective to what they remain up against in their daily lives all the time today. Yeah, it's, it's, it doesn't sap their strength, <coughs> it just helps a little bit lighten the load. I understand that, but I have to tell you, they don't want it. Uh, black people um, um, uh, discriminate against each other more than whites discriminate against blacks. And if you could do something about that, then we appreciate it. But we, we hate each other more so than white people hate us. So that's what needs to be dealt with. Can you get a law for that? Or? <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. I wanted to ask you, do you have children? I do. Um, <clears throat> if you found yourself maybe in another country or somewhere where your child had to go to school and he was maybe in a black community, just say he's in a black community, he's the only white person, and he come, comes home every day and says, they don't like me and they're picking on me, the teacher doesn't like me, and she's not you know, giving me the best grades because of that, would you uh, go in and try to legislate things to be differently, or would you tell him to work harder and try to be better at it? Let me try to imagine the situation. Um, the child is having these problems. Well, all right. Um, I'm there. I've moved there. I'm going to be there for the rest of my life. And my child is going to grow up a citizen of that country and have to make his way in that country, right? That's what you're saying? Then he has to stay there. He has he to has stay to, there, and he, he has, has to, to work hard, and he has to overcome. And he has to overcome. He and does. This is what we're saying. We're saying we will overcome, and we will be better off for it. And what you're saying, I would not teach my child to do. I would not teach my child to, well, I'll go in and help you out, because it won't make them better. It, they need to fight their own battles. Well, That's I, what we're saying here. I am extremely supportive of this attitude that I've heard so much of in the last four sessions that we've had, because... In this, this care and concern for the children, this not wanting to, to coddle and pa pamper the children, this idea that or they, the th that, you know, or the, this whole idea that, you know, it, we, have to, we have to be strong. It is exactly this heart and soul of the black community that has put the black community where it is and, and is something that the black community should be so proud of. And the areas where it's broken down is where we have as a society broken down also, where well, we haven't been strong. We have broken down as a well, society. Well, I, I, I agree that there are gaps in the that, you know, that not everybody's able to reach the high standard that many African Americans set for strength. I, I certainly agree with that. But what all I'm saying, and I wish that I could just bridge the gap because we're not really saying such different things. All I'm saying is you don't really have to worry that the kind of things that white people are trying to do with a few civil rights laws and a little bit of an extra, uh, a little bit of a, you got a heavy hand here and somebody's just trying to put a little hand here, they can't ever bring that scale together with they hopefully in the future they will, but in the near term they're never going to get it even. And the idea that I hear so much fear that well, we can't, we can't take anything because if we take anything, it'll make us weak. It's not fear. Uh, that's, it's that's not wrong. fear. But what we are saying is, is because you've done all these things, we have not come together as a people to take care of each other because if we had come together as a people, we not, would never have needed any of your handouts. And we, if we were in lack, if we were lacking anything, we would have come together and found our resources among ourselves and come to you from an economic base and fight our fight our battles that way. We can come to you as a strong economic base and say we want our civil rights or we want to be in this industry and that way you would have more respect for us that way. The way we're doing it now you don't have respect. Well one, one of the things that, that, that always happens when you get sort of a, a sort of Afrocentric or, or, or black power centered uh, organizing principles is that white people respond incredibly positive by and large, 
I, white people just love to hear that those black people, you know, are not going to bother us. They don't want anything from us. They're all going to go away. They're not going to want to go to our schools. They're not going to want to live in our neighborhoods. Oh, goody is the reaction of all too many white people. Now, I know we've all noticed I'm a white person. That's what I bring. I've lived in that part of our country my whole life, and I, I am bringing to this dialogue my experience of the other side of this, which is too much selfishness, too much bigotry, too much exclusion, and I'm trying to get the word out to, to my community that, you know, you guys are being piggy. You're being mean-spirited and piggy, and you ought to stop it. This is a great group of people, and you should stop whining because they happen to be making some progress. But Part the, of me thinks that, the, the, that people are upset because black people are strong, no, and, and it's really not people, fair. The reason white people are upset is because we're still begging and whining and whimping and wanting special treatment. That's why they're upset. I do not they're, think they're most black people are doing that. Well, but they are. Look, the, the, the press in this country will go and, and put a mic in the face of any black person who wants to whine and complain and, and act like, outrageous. It, like it is a disproportionate amount of attention goes to poor welfare mothers and, and dysfunctional uh, drug addicts and all kinds of underclass phenomenon over here and then a lot of uh, you know very angry uh, kind of politic politicization over here. The picture that people get is completely distorted and yeah, I mean that is one of the problems all of us white and black have in understanding each other. White people are acting on really bad information about what black people are about right now. And so some of their behavior can be excused by the fact that they have very bad information. On the other hand, there it's there, it's white reporters, it's white press we have got to get to where more people understand what is going on with most black people in this country. I was at a, a meeting about affirmative action just last night where a guy said about affirmative action, well, I don't think we can do anything about this white guy political meeting. I don't think that we can support this initiative, This, I mean, oppose this initiative. I think this, is gonna, this thing is going to pass because basically, you know, you turn on the television, it's just a lot of black people robbing and stealing and, and you know, they're just criminals and violent and, and, you know, I think most white people, you know, they just figure that who wants to help those people? They're just not anybody you'd want to help. If I had been there at that meeting, I would say, right on, you are absolutely Well, correct. that is ridiculous. Because That's absolutely ridiculous. That is so <laughs> but, hostile no, to, that is right. so hostile to Let black people. You. That's no, so unfair. The reason that these kids are robbing and stealing and, and taking advantage of because, first of all, they have a failing home. The parents are not there. And as a result, uh, the government, affirmative action is given to them so they never have to develop their own self, themselves. They're out there tearing everything down because life is made easy for them. That's why they're doing it. Well, exactly what proportion of black kids do you think are robbing and stealing? Too many. Well, what do you think? The, what do you if, think it if, is? If it's do you one, just give me a number, please? If it's one, that's too many. Well, of course, one's too many. But tell me, tell me what you think the percentage is. I, I, it doesn't matter. Too many. Well, look, all the major inner cities is happening. Well, look. The, the, the fact of the matter is that, that black crime, pe people are finally waking up to the fact that black crime is not significantly disproportional to black poverty. You have three times the poverty rate, you have three times the crime rate. And so this whole idea that black people are somehow hardwired to be criminal, which is sort of what myth goes they are, on. They are, because oh, of the that's, of the oh, that's Oh, that's ridiculous. Real quick, and then I want to ask what's going to happen with this whole affirmative action issue. Real quick. Okay, real quick is yeah, um, she tr she's treating black men as they're so inferior. Yeah. Like, you know, they cannot get anywhere without you. I think it's an ego trip of the government. They want men to be supported and therefore they cannot find themselves within and the God within and to be strong. And we so it's to, all a, um, what's it, it's an ego thing where, ooh, we're helping, you know, any, any liberal, ooh, we're helping these poor old black men. They cannot get yeah. anywhere without us. And it's and an ego trip for them and it and the keeps You know why? Yeah. Because we act that way. Exactly, we let exactly, it so we let yes, it exactly. So. What's gonna happen with Thank affirmative you. action? This, this whole issue, will it, will it, uh, will we vote it out or what's going to happen, you think? Well, I think that people who think it's an easy one, that it's going to win very easily, 
are wrong, and I seem to be joined in that assessment by William Crystal, who was one of the chief uh, strategists for the Republican Party. The women who are greatly affected by this have not been heard from. Um, it's still very early in the process. We've only begun the educational process, and it's very, um, I think right now, everybody thinks it's more of a winner for the proponents than it really is going to turn out to be. Uh, I have to say in closing, I hope that it is a winner for the proponents. Um, and we, uh, Bond is a, a nonprofit organization. We have about 3,000 members now, and hopefully we can incur women and men, black and white, to come together and finally get rid of this stuff and start living as true Americans. I do appreciate you coming on. You've been a very good sport tonight. I appreciate it. I really do. Yeah.